This morning, we're going to take the topic, Caption, 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 His Vision for the Harvest. And notice that I underline His Vision. His Vision. That's where the emphasis, emphasis has to be placed. Many of us have the ideals and have ideals and ways that we want to do things. And sometimes we're even bold enough to tell one another it's either my way or no way. But we got to understand that it's all about God's way. But in order for us to be saved at the end of this spiritual journey, we must do things God's way and no other way. That is, if you want heaven to be your home. This is called salvation. In today's world, we do not hear too much teaching and preaching on salvation. Church, this is why we're working for, to live and work out our soul salvation, Philippians 2 and 12. Verses 42, 34 through 42 was read unto your hearing this morning, but this morning, we're going to have to go to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 4. In order that we may be pleasing to God, in order that we may have the 2020 vision that is required to do his will. So we got to understand this whole chapter in order to understand the vision of the harvest. The first thing, the first thing that Christ want his disciples to see. And when I say his disciples, I'm talking about you and I. Is that all souls are important. All souls are important. And we must meet people where they are. Ezekiel 18 and 4 tells us that all souls belong to God. All souls belong to God. The event that surrounds this passage is a very familiar one. The one about Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman that he met at the well. We look at verses 4 through 9, we see Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. And when he had arrived at Samaria, he was exhausted. He was tired. He was weary from the long journey. So he came to a place near a well, or at the well. And so what we find in verse 4 is that when we do God's will, sometimes it may cause us to go to unlovely places. Unlovely places. But notice that in verse 4, he needed to go through Samaria. The main reason why Jesus had to go through Samaria was because he had an appointment with a sinful woman at the well. Now, this woman didn't know that she had an appointment, but Jesus knew that he had an appointment. He also had an appointment with other Samaritans in that area as well, and and many of which would have their lives changed by him going to Samaria. You see, Jesus was traveling, and he was leaving Judea, which is sort of the greater Jerusalem metropolitan area, and he was going to Galilee, the area where he grew up and often ministered. And as we already saw in verse 4, 
it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. Now, I understand that he could avoid Samaria by doing what many of the devout Jews would do. They would go around the long way to keep from going through Samaria. And he could have done that. So why not go through Samaria? You see, Samaria to the Jews was an unlovely place. But Jesus went to Samaria. Why did Jesus go to Samaria? It was an unlovely place that people needed help. It was an unlovely place where people needed help. And, and, and as we, if we're going to be honest about it, uh, even today, when, when most of us share the gospel, we want to go to nice places, lovely places, where the people are more receptive, possibly, and easy to share the gospel with. But unlovely places is where people need Jesus also. And that's what we cannot forget. Jesus may ask you to go to an unlovely place to share the gospel. It might be an unlovely work situation. It may be an unlovely school situation. It may be an unlovely neighborhood. Or even it may be Jesus is calling you to go to an unlovely country. But if we are going to capture the, his vision, the important thing we must do is humble ourselves to go with the salvation message wherever God sends us. He also went to unlovely people. He also went to unlovely people. In verses 5 through 6, our Lord arrived in Samaria at the well. And Jesus was very tired. He was weary. And this reminds us that he, as God in the flesh, experience all the physical limitations that we experience today. You see, Jesus asked us not to do anything that he has not already done and defeated. You know, he could have used his special um, uh, uh, powers, or, um, um, but however, what he did, he walked this earth just like you and I, as a man. He, 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 he used that to show us that it can be done. So it also reminds us that he did not use being tired as an excuse, but he shared the gospel with this woman. According to verse 8, the disciples went to buy food and left Jesus alone. And in verse 7, the time was probably high noon. And this was a time that Women, women uh, usually came to the well, did not usually come to the well, I should say, because it was too hot. And we also find that women travel as a group together. But this woman was alone. Understand, this was because she probably was shunned by the other women. This woman was an immoral woman, unlovely as a sinner. And because of this, because of her lifestyle, because of the things that she did, she was not readily accepted by others. So the etiquette of that day would even have frowned upon a Jewish rabbi talking to any woman. But this not only was a woman, but this was a son woman. And we find Jesus talking to this woman. But Jesus cared for souls went beyond man etiquette. And the same way with us, if we're going to be followers of Christ and if we're going to capture his vision, then do we too have to put aside our personal feelings, put aside what society may think and accept what God is calling us to do. Verse 9, the woman was shocked that Jesus would even talk to her. And she was even more shocked that he drank from the water pitcher that belonged to a Samaritan. For this was something that the Jews did not do in dealing with the Samaritan. Excuse me, dealing with the Samaritan. Now, would Jesus have survived if he did not drink water? Yes, he probably would have. 
But you got to understand Jesus' motive, motive was to draw this unlovely, immoral woman into a conversation. Even today, we got to make contact in order, in order to be effective for winning soul for Christ. I know sometimes because of today's etiquette, we, we try to use tact, but sometimes we use so much tact until we don't make contact. So we got to understand that it's not about tact for your purpose, but it's about how do I win this soul over Christ. When we do things like he wants us to do them, when we are trying to please him and not trying to please man. So I want you to realize two things. First of all, we all are unlovely people. We all are unlovely people. Isaiah 64 and 6 help us to understand that fact. And as Jesus humbled himself to talk to unlovely people, who are we not to do the same? Who are we not to do the same? I'm sure we all know some unlovely people who need Jesus. And you may want to whisper to yourself and say, Lord, please let it not be me. Please let it not be me. We, we find unlovely people are cruel. They may be hateful, immoral, and they may just be downright unpleasant. But guess what? They need you to humble yourself and become their friend and tell them about Jesus. See, all you have to do is just share Jesus. And that's all you have is Jesus to share. It's not about you, but it's about Jesus. I, um, my haste of uh, getting up here, I forgot the most important two, my Bible. <laughs> but I got it right here. And um, But let's look at John uh, 4, and uh, you should already be there. As we look at John 4, and we read verses 32 and 34, John 4, verses 32 through 34. And the Bible reads, but he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought, brought anything to, he eat, to him to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. So another thing, another thing that we need to understand that Christ wants his disciples to see, that you and I, is to be obedient and to do the will of God. Now, what does that entail? Doing the will of God means doing things like he said to do them, doing things the what? like he said to do. So we got to make sure we do the things that he tells us to do, and most important, that we do them like he said to do. So, so it, it's about understanding God's word and understanding not trying to figure out how you slice and dice his word in order that it into your will. So that's number one when we talk about Doing the will of God. First thing, we got to be obedient to the will. Secondly, we got to do the will. Being obedient is doing the will of God. Why? Because God said it, I believe it, and that's telling. Nothing else needs to be said. Because God said it, and I believe it. It's just up to me to do it. God give us that power of choice, but it's a misuse by so many 
because we work on our timetable, not God's timetable. But remember, it's about his vision, his will. You see, we do not need to ask the Lord why. We just need to do it. John 14, 15, and John 15, 23 let us know that if you love me, then you will keep or obey my commandments. Very simple. That's in black and white and red. So, 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 so to Jesus, you see, Samaria was a, a land of obedience. And why I say that? Because it was an opportunity for him to obey. Many times we have opportunities that are presented to us to obey. And God has only given us an opportunity to obey. But he doesn't make you do anything. He doesn't make you do anything. You see, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Because this is where God the Father wanted him to go. That's number one. God wanted him to go there. He asked no question. He went there. And we must also remember that some of our toughest times will come as we strive beating your life for God. That's going to be some of our toughest times. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 to 23, as well as John 14 and 15. You, you got to be at a certain place in your life in order to need to eat the food to do the will of God. Jesus, he didn't eat food. He just ate food that was given to him. That was to do the will of God. It's not a spiritual right. Or not, it's not a spiritual right that you can eat this food. But we must understand that it is a spiritual desire. It is a spiritual desire. Perhaps the disciples were surprised to find Jesus all energetic, energized. All energized. With the fact that they had just left a while ago, and he was tired and he was weary. He was exhausted. And so they did not understand that. They could not put two and two together with that. They could not understand how this man was so tired and worn out. And all of a sudden, he's all energized. That's because why? He was doing the will of God. So they told him, Rabbi, eat. But he told them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. And so they start asking themselves, because they didn't understand what that meant. So they start asking themselves, did, did somebody bring him some food? You know, because they, they, they did not see, they did not see the vision and understand what Christ was talking about. Because they were too carnal minded. They could not see because they were not where they needed to be spiritually. And they was thinking worldly. And that's why we got to examine ourselves and check ourselves and make sure that we are in line spiritually. Our spiritual man is being fed, number one. Spiritual man is striving to do the will of God. Jesus was hungry to do the will of God. Jesus was hungry to do the will of God. The meat that he had was the satisfaction of doing the will of God. That's what his meat. He was full of doing the will of God. You know, those that are in love, you know, when you're so deep in love, you want to eat. You was full of love. You know, but he was full off doing the will of God. He was full off doing the will of God, which is so much better. Part of Jesus' hunger to do the will of God was to see souls come and to know him as the Savior. Which brings us to the third eye-opening teachable moment for the disciples. 
you and I. Verses 35 through 42. Verses 35 through 42. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? It's Jesus speaking. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the field, for they are already white for the harvest. And when he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit, for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman he who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritan had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed for, he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. In verse 42. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because you said. For we ourselves have heard him and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. Thirdly, Christ wants his disciples to see the call to be a soul winner. The call to be a soul winner. This particular passage of scripture is an evangelistic one that calls us to stay, not to stay amongst ourselves, but go into the world and preach the gospel, teach the gospel. We know that as Christians, it's our responsibility to teach the word of God to a sin sick world. How can they hear? If we fail to teach them, how can they come if we fail to not go and bring them? Better yet, he is encouraging us. He's calling us. That's better. He's calling us to be a soul winner. And this is from the Old Testament, Psalms 107, 2. And of course, our foundation strip for evangelism. 28, 1920, and also 1 Peter 3 and 15 as well. Now, we know that the greatest soul winner of all times was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He didn't just talk the game, but he walked the walk. And he put his action where his mouth was. See, and Jesus is our greatest example that we should follow. Not only did he win every soul that is saved through his death on the cross, but while he was on this earth, he did personal evangelism himself. As an example to us, he did it to win souls over. We understand that the Bible in Luke tells us that Jesus came not that he may be served, but he may serve others, that he may save souls. He came seeking and saving souls. That's his whole mission on this earth was to seek and to save souls. In this text in um, John, we, we see the master soul winner at work, Jesus himself. As Jesus dealt with the woman at the well. Please note, he caught her attention. Verses 4 through 9. You see, while the disciples went for food, Jesus rested at the well. And the woman came for the water at an unusual time of the day because she was probably an outcast because of her immoral behavior. 
So Jesus asked her for a drink of water. And this is very unusual for him as a Jew to ask her as a Samaritan. And even more so because she was a woman. And to speak to her and talk to her. For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans at all. None at all. The second point that we can pull from this interaction that help us to know that the type of soul winner he was, his method was first to catch her attention, verses 4 through 9. Then he created an interest in verses 10 through 15. Although she didn't understand what Jesus was talking about, his offer of living water certainly got her attention. She didn't understand it, but it drawed her in to be curious enough to try to understand what this living water was. Thirdly, are the strategy that Jesus used that he challenged her heart in verses 16 through 26. Concerning her past, he dealt with that. Concerning her worship, he dealt with that. And even concerning her identity, he dealt with that. And fourthly, he calls results, verses 27 through 30. So obviously the woman believed because she, she went to the village and she called the man to meet, to come and meet the one she was sure was the Messiah. So what we need to remember is that it's our duty to teach God's word. But it's always the Spirit of God who works when people believe. You see, all we can do is to plant and to water. But certainly it's going to be God that gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. What we have to understand is that we have to understand the law of the harvest. What you sow or plant it's what you're going to reap. That's what's going to come up. If you plant the seed of discord, if you plant the seed of hatred, if you plant the seed of mistreatment of others, guess what you're going to get? Those same things that you planted. But if you plant the seed of love, joy, and peace, that is what will come up in your life. See, a farmer plants to gain something with a purpose. Jesus saw something in this American woman and knew that she was not fulfilling her purpose. The woman opened her, herself up to understanding the word of God. And then she realized her purpose. And she didn't stop there. She went and taught others. And that's the impact that it should have on us. Is that first we got to go to God and consult him in terms of what our purpose. What is his will? And then it needs to change our lives. And when it changes our lives, we should be willing to share that with others, that their lives may be changed as well. It was all about saving one soul at a time, beginning with man. Saving one soul at a time, beginning with man. You see, the interesting thing about this is that she got it, but the disciples failed to get it. These spiritual people fail to, to, to receive the word of God. And sometimes what happens is that we get too complacent as spiritual people until we think we have arrived. And, let to, and yet to know that the only time we will arrive is when we stand before God and judge. The time we got to get it right is right now. That's the only time you have. No, not even the next second is promised to you. So, so when you know, when you understand, even if you're unsure, it's best to be sure and get it right as the opportunity is presented to you. Jesus revealed to his disciples that they did not understand their purpose, nor their mission. You see, they had gone into town to buy food, but they missed the opportunity. 
to share the good news while they were there. And that's what God was trying to help them to see. Jesus was trying to help them to see is that, look, every time you come in contact with somebody, that's an opportunity to share God's word. And sometimes it's not about opening your mouth, but it's the way you carry yourself as well. Because people will read you before they hear any words that you got to say. So we got to understand that we always got to be on point for God and sharing God's word by the lives that we live as well as the words that we share with them through the word of God. He was pointing out to them that the spirit of harvest was always ready and must be reaped before it spoils. That's opportunity. You never know when you're going to come back in contact with somebody alive. You never know when you're going to have opportunity to even share God's word with them. So when you have that opportunity, it's best that you share it with them. He said, open your eyes. Look. The time is right. He said, the time is right. And with that, we understand that the eyes were shut while they were looking. And Jesus was helping them to see. You see, you may reap only if you sow. You will reap what you do or do not sow. It's impossible for you not to plant some and, and reap. The law of harvest applies to all, to all of our active service, whatever it may be, for the will of God. So if you're not reaping, then it's quite possible that you're not planting. And if you're not, and if you're receiving, reaping something that, 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 that you don't know where it came from, it came from you. That's where you start. That's where you start. You start with me, you, yourself. Church, we must open our eyes. For the law of the harvest is in full effect. We, the church, will reap what we sow. And if you don't know how to sow, every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock on Sunday evening, we are equipping the saints to go out and save souls. Save souls. We're starting with ourselves and preparing to share God's word as we go into the world. You see, Jesus also gave them encouragement to become a reaper, a harvester, because they had received the commission. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, Matthew 4 and 19. You see, some things is right there. It's already, the work has already been put in of the labor to, to, to plant. But now God is asking us to come alone and, and do the work to, to reap for his benefit. He has already planted the seeds in someone hard, and they're just waiting for you to come along and share God's word. Because, you know, somebody might say, well, how do I know for sure? You don't know for sure. That's why you got to hit them all and let God decide from there. And that's what we must do. We should not live just to be living, but we should be living for a purpose. And sometimes, some people may need motivation. So just being encouraging to someone else. That might be what, what maybe you're calling as well to do. When we look at the application of this message, the question is, how do we become aware or how do we see the harvest and realize that our personal responsibility is to do our part? So we all have a part. We constantly talk about the church being a body. We understand how the body works together. Every member is important. And every member has a part. As much as you think you don't have a part, you do. 
you know, you may be seeing some progress that this congregation is making. But just think of how greater the, con um, the progress would be if you would just chip in and do your part. You know, um, playing basketball some uh, years ago, um, I remember the coach telling us that, um, you know, you may go out there and uh, you may be super player. And then you go out there and drink and, um, you know, stay up night and just run your physical body or whatever the case is. And then you come to court, you come to play basketball, and, and you may do a good job. But the thing is, is that you would never know how good you could have been. You never know how good you could have been. And the same thing applies to us is that, you know, as well as you think we are doing, God has called us to be better and to be greater. And we need every member to do their part. Yes, you got a part. And if you don't know what your part is, just come. And we're all working with fellowship in the morning. Uh, just come at fellowship in order that we may understand how we, we fit together. Because you may have something that I need and I may have something that you need, but we can put it together for the cause of God to make it work and be that greater, that greater congregation that God has called us to be. What we got to do is we got to gain the knowledge. We got to get in God's word and understand what his will is. We got to understand that knowledge. We got to gain that knowledge that God has for us. So we, in our knowing, we got to know what to look for. And there's three type of people we're looking for in helping them. We're looking for sinners, good and bad people who have never lived in God's way. We're looking for the Parker son, those who have stopped serving God, those who have been in the body, but they have fallen off. Those are the ones that we got to reach out to as well. And we also got to look for that unfaithful Christian. They serve in God, but they serve in God at a minimum level. A minimum level. But see, it's nothing minimal about my God. My God is so great. He's so big. Someone once said that he's so big until when he moves, he bumps into himself. That's how big my God is. And those that follow him, he has called for us to do great things for the kingdom of God. The next thing we look at as well is that as we look at the knowledge and the vision, is being able to see it. And I know you heard the saying that you can't see the trees for the forest. We must be able to see people where they are. We need to see them where they are. And how can we encourage them to move to the greater place that God has called them to be? We must be able to be honest about people lifestyles and behaviors in light of Christianity. See, we can't afford to, to cover up appropriate living. We can't be a partaker of that. Sunday morning, we've been working with our adult class and caring enough to correct. Caring enough to correct. And I've been some powerful lesson on that. Um, but we got to care enough to correct. You see, I'd rather err on the side of you getting mad because I'm trying to help you than you getting mad because I didn't do anything. That's how I feel about it. I feel that, that uh, we should at least try. Now, that was my feeling. But God expects you to do. God expects you to help. God expects you to care enough to correct. Because if you allow them to continue to go in the path they're going into, guess what? They are only destroying themselves. And, and how can we allow brothers or sisters to destroy themselves? You see, we got to think about it like this. If, if it was a baby that did not know any better, we'll jump in front of a, a, a car to save that baby. 
But that's how our love for lost souls should be as well. We should be concerned enough for lost souls that causes us to go beyond the call of duty to save a lost soul. The next thing we have to do is that we have to incorporate love. Prepares us into all good things. Love prepares us into all good things. When we have the power of love and we implement it, then we can live as true Christians, which is a personal requirement. And then we truly can help others as well. I love them enough to help. To live right before them. And to teach them the true Christianity and tell them about salvation. That's where the love come in at. I love my brothers. Oh, I love myself enough to do right by God. I love my brother and sister to be a good example for him or her. And I love them enough to teach them about the truth of God's word. And the last thing that we got to understand in this vision and responsibility, and understanding this vision and responsibility, and understanding how to become aware or to see the harvest, and to realize that it's our personal responsibility to do. The third thing is movement. When prepare, we move. And, and that's just simply to do. See, we, see, we, can, we, we, can, we can fellowship, we can, we can study God's word, we can understand God's word, but until we do, it does us any, no good. It does us no good. It's just like doing the will of God. We got to do. It's very important that we do. So we got to step into the field and we got to work and we got to have a plan. We got to labor with the intensity of doing well for God. Of doing well for God. You see, the thing is, is that it's all about the actions that follow the understanding. It's all about getting an understanding, studying God's word as well as, and most important, is to do God's word. To do God's word. When we look at Proverbs 11 and 30, and that's the scripture I want to leave with you. Proverbs 11 and 30. If you dare say amen. If you're not, say just give me a little bit more time. Here and now, we'll go forward. Proverbs 11 and 30. And it reads, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. And he who wins souls is wise. Church, we got to understand it's all about working the harvest. We see the harvest. We understand the vision that God has for the harvest, which is to work the harvest, to help some lost soul to understand who God is and, and encourage them and teach them to the point that they too may respond before it's everlasting too late. God's invitation is extended to all, and we must understand that. We must also understand the fact that we as a church, we as a congregation, we as God's people, we cannot afford to get discouraged because the choices that we make is what we're going to reproduce. And see, the thing is that we can plant today, and maybe 10, 20 years later, that the fruit is harvest. You know, so you have to think about now. You always have to think about the now. You know, don't think about, well, you know, I can do this and, you know, and I can come back later, whatever the case may be. No, when you have the opportunity to come back and get it right, that's the opportunity that you 
to take advantage of it. But we got to be careful what we plant. You know, our purpose remains, and, and we must be committed. And we must work with the intensity that is pleasing to God. Matthew 9, let us know that, you know, the harvest is ripe. It's ready. But God is calling for more workers. He needs the workers. And the workers is you and I. The workers are you and I. Those are the workers. So have enough compassion for your brother to know that if you don't do the work, then that's just going to make double load for your brother. But jump in and, and, and do your part. And uh, where you can do more, do more for the cause of God. See, when we have that spirit of being a good worker for God, when we have that committed spirit to be committed to God and all the way, all the, all the way in, Matthew 6.33 help us to understand where we need to seek God first, and we will seek God first. It becomes not about me, but it becomes about God. You know, everything in my life, I should be wondering, and I should be asking God, how does this apply? How does this impact your will? Your calling for me. How does this help your call? 32 also and 33 again, we reap whatever we sow. We reap whatever we sow. And God's prayers are that we sow the good fruits. The Lord knows there's a lot of bad fruits that have been sowed. You know, you ever thought about this, that the world may be still standing because of you being a faithful Christian, being a faithful worker. God may be trying to help this wicked world. Unfortunately, it seems like it's getting more wicked day by day, which should cause us to ask the question, what more? can I do? And what more can I do? What more do I need to do? You know, when we think about God's calling us to work the harvest, we got to be all the way in. 100%. 100%. God invitation extended to all. It extended to those that may not be a Christian and, and they need to become a Christian by being obedient to God. Doing things like He say do them, how He say to do them. You know, hear the gospel. Believe that which you have heard. To a point of understanding, I understand the belief is an action. It prompts you into an action. And that action should convict you well enough that it causes you to repent. Luke 13 and 3. And repent is not just asking for forgiveness, but it's about changing your heart. It's about changing your heart. I was walking in the direction away from Christ, but now I'm going to turn around and go back to Christ. That's what repentance is. It's coming back or going to Christ. Then after you have repented, then you confess Christ to be the son of the living God. And it's not just saying that with words, but it's giving you allegiance to God. It's giving you a commitment to God. It's saying that, hey, I'm going to follow Christ at all costs. And then you go down in a water grave of baptism. You bear it, cover it up. The old man is buried. And you rise up as a new person in Christ. That gets you in. But Revelation 2 and 10 let us know that we have to be faithful unto death. Even if it causes me death, I'm going to be faithful to God. Even if my friends turn their back against me, I'm going to be faithful to God. 
I'm committed. I'm all the way in. Even when I have to stand alone, I'm going to be faithful to God because that's who I'm seeking to please. You know, I may already be a member of the Lord's Church, a baptized Christian, and, but because we are in the flesh from time to time, we do come into sin because we live in this world. But God has put something in place with that. You can go back to the cross. You see, Christ died for sin once. He defeated sin. So therefore, we should never become slaves to sin. Because we sin and we're in this flesh, there's no excuse to stay there. But the thing is, is that if you're committed to God, you use that opportunity as forgiveness. You use that blessing that God has already blessed us with. With a strong heart. Whatever your desires are this morning, you may make it known as we together stand. Lord,